don't be original. Never just kind of come up with something out of the blue. Always base it off of a previously successful video. That's Jake Thomas, a title specialist whose channels have done over 100 million views because he spent thousands of hours studying viral titles and the psychology of what made people click. Out of the almost 1,000 titles that are broken down, 60% have curiosity, 46% have desire, and 39% have fear. In this episode, you'll learn how to model successful titles. I create two lists called the Dream 10 and the Model 10. Pretty much like any question that you could have about YouTube can be answered from your Dream 10 or your Model 10. What most creators are getting wrong. So many people, they only want titles in their niche. They only want ideas in their niche. Stop copying directly from your competitors. And much more. Thank you to Artlist for sponsoring this video. What is the job of the title on a YouTube video? What does a good title do for you? First off, it depends on the traffic source. I think that the, the job of the title is to confirm like, yes, you do want to click this video. Uh, yes, this is what you're looking for. Let's say you're trying to get uh, traffic on like the homepage um, or, or, um, or uh, you know, recommended, you know, especially the homepage. If you're just, you're not really actively searching for something, you're just going to YouTube and you're like, all right, what does YouTube have for me? It's very kind of passive. When you're in this kind of passive you know, hunt for content, your title just, you kind of want to like just get out of the way. Like, yes, this is what, exactly what you're looking for. Um, we don't want to overwhelm you. Uh, click on the video. If you have a super long title, it's a lot of work to, to read a whole title, process in your head, okay, do I actually want to watch this video? Do I not? In that case, it it is just kind of, you want it to be simple and clear and very, very easy to understand. If you are uh, searching, so if you're trying to rank and search, it's a little different because people, um, they're more actively hunting for, for an answer, really. So you want your title to be like, hey, this video is for you. Like, this is exactly what you're looking for. You know, click on this video. This has me thinking about my own viewing behavior. I'm glad you're separating out like recommended areas versus search areas, because when I'm searching for something, it strikes me that I actually read the titles before I look at the thumbnail. The title is more important to me on search than the thumbnail is. But when I'm on the YouTube homepage, if I'm just thinking about, hey, I'm going to be on the, the, the bike for 45 minutes and I want to watch a video. I'm definitely looking at the thumbnails first because they're larger for, for a bit of the card. So what have you learned about viewer behavior and how titles complement thumbnails? Do you find that people act like me or do you find that people put more weight in titles or thumbnails? What do you think? I think what you just described is pretty spot on, at least from my experience. For instance, a thumbnail, I came across a thumbnail the other day. The thumbnail text was, you know, it was like, don't do this. And then the title was like 10 mistakes to buying land. So, you know, it was don't do this. Like, so the warning in the thumbnail was great. You know, it got your attention and got you to read the title. It was like, okay, shoot, like, you know, this, you know, this, uh, the, this thumbnail is one of the mistakes. I, I want to know more. I want to know what all the mistakes are. He did the exact same title like, you know, his next video or a couple of videos later. And the thumbnail text was just like, it wasn't as punchy. It wasn't as powerful. And even though we have the same exact title, the, the way that the thumbnail and the title work together, um, it was not as powerful. It didn't make you want to know more. And I think that not a lot of people are putting enough thought into, okay, what is my title or what is my thumbnail going to make somebody think? And then you know, how is my title going to continue that thought process. So I know, I know where I'm like speaking, like in kind of like super high level stuff. Um, but a lot of people will just like kind of repeat, um, you know, your, your title and your thumbnail. And I was doing some research yesterday on diary of a CEO and I was trying to make the case that like, oh yeah, you should never do that. And then I noticed the diary of CEO did that kind of a lot, but they seemed to only do it when what they were saying was so powerful. So like one example was like, leave the United States before 2030. And it was like such a great warning. And that was just so powerful that it's like, okay, you know, you can do that. Um, but for most people, uh, if you don't have a super powerful thing, then you need to kind of think of how do I attack, you know, or how do I, you know, leverage somebody's curiosity in different ways. So like the thumbnail might build, like, you know, be a warning and maybe there's some curiosity. And then the, 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 the title is like, you know, all curiosity or even desire. Um, so like for the most part, when you're thinking about getting people to click, you think of like, you know, fear, curiosity and desire. Those are the three click worthy emotions. So it's like, how can I use, you know, one in the in the title? And then, you know, can I can I mix and match those three emotions in the title and the thumbnail?
so yeah, I think uh, I think most people sh could benefit from uh, from having different stuff in the in the title and thumbnail. However, if you have a really really good um, concept, then you can get away with it. What is the difference in terms of impact views that a good title has over a bad title? It can be uh, it can be massive. So we could talk about the impact, and then we could talk about the effort. <laughs> so uh, the effort is. 10 words, right? Uh, five to 10 words. Um, you know, we don't need, uh, we don't need graphic design skills. We don't need like crazy lighting and like really good assets. Uh, we don't need a script writer, you know, to write 2000 words and all this stuff. It's just five to 10 words. So if you can get better at YouTube titles, it can be uh, insanely beneficial. Um, so that is the, the good news about YouTube titles. One example I have is I worked for, or I did like a little bit of title writing for um, for a B2B uh, YouTube channel. They were super boring. All they did was like uh, their CEO would go on podcasts and they would just like cut it up. So like, oh, let's just repurpose all the other content for YouTube. And they would get like, I don't know, two, three, 400 views. And all I did was write better titles and make uh, a little bit like better thumbnail text. Like the thumbnail was just literally a screenshot from the video because they didn't want to build any assets. And they would get like two to five times more views um, with all we did was change the words. And um, they were in a very boring market. However, they made a lot of money. So, you know, doubling or five, five Xing their views, you know, probably made them a lot of money. Um, so that was just like, that's a super small answer. Um, I have a channel and um, it's like a little secret side project. And I was modeling one of like one of my competitors' best videos. I wrote a better title. Uh, their video had like a million views. Mine had like 7 million views. So in that case, uh, you know, writing a better title got me 6 million views more than my competitor. That was very, uh, <laughs> that was very, uh, very nice to see. So, you know, it can be huge. It can be, you know, going from 200 views to 1,000 views, or it can be going from 1 million views to 7 million views um, and e even more. And that's just, that's just my experience. It makes me think there's, for every package, there's probably some theoretical spectrum of how good that package, that idea can perform. And there's a wideness to that spectrum. And that's probably true for titles and thumbnails. And I'm wondering if the spectrum is broader between a bad title and a good title versus a bad thumbnail and a good thumbnail. I don't know the answer, but it kind of speaks to whether you think one is more potentially powerful than the other, I guess. That is a great question. So I think super generally, I think that titles are more important for educational channels and thumbnails are more important for entertainment channels. Hmm. So, you know, if we were talking about entertainment channels, uh, you know, the spectrum of a good or a bad thumbnail could be massive. Um, and I think that I think that that's where you would get the most out of your of your efforts and your research. And like thinking up with a, of a good idea with a really good thumbnail, like how can you just build so much like anticipation um, in this thumbnail if you have an entertainment channel? Um, and then, you know, in that case, the, the title is pretty much just like, hey, this is what this video is about. Like, it's crazy. You're going to love it. Um, versus if you have an educational channel, you know, the you for the most part, you can only get so creative in your thumbnails. You know, you see way more powerful thumbnails in, in entertainment. But in education, you know, especially if you're, you know, like with your channel, like you can't have a crazy thumbnail showing like, you know, me doing like something insane or like, you know, are you doing, you know, something crazy? It's like, you know, it's as a podcast, <laughs> like we're not doing anything nuts, but we can have very powerful words that, that grab our audience's attention, like speak to them, like at their core, um, you know, talk about their hopes, their dreams, their fears. I think you're spot on that the spectrum can be huge. And I think it's depending on if you're education or entertainment. Yeah, really focusing on generating curiosity with our titles was a huge takeaway that I had from our first conversation. And then continuing to feed into that curiosity with the video's intro through the visuals and sound. Actually, the first episode we did together was the first time on the channel where we started to add music and sound to our intros with the help of Artlist, who happens to be our sponsor for this video. Artlist is your all-in-one platform for creative assets that will take your videos to the next level. Need to find the perfect song to set the tone of your video? How about sound effects to immerse your audience at the beach? Hiking through the rainforest? 
exploring a city, use Artlist. We use Artlist for all of our videos and love it. It completely leveled up our podcast intros, which was a huge catalyst for growth on this channel. And with Artlist Max, we can get music, sound effects, footage, and motion graphics templates for one price without having to worry about any of the licensing. Sign up with our link in the description and you will get two free months on any annual subscription. Thank you to Artlist for supporting the channel. The last time we talked, you mentioned, again, these three click-worthy emotions of curiosity, desire, and fear. And the way you described it then was like, curiosity is kind of the top level. That's really what you're ultimately trying to do. And then you tie that to either uh, desire or fear in both the title and thumbnail. Is that still how you think about it? Yeah, it is. Um, it's even like, I guess more prevalent. So last time we talked was, I don't know, like a year ago or something. And um, my newsletter, I break down like kind of five viral videos every week. And I'm just seeing the same stuff. It's been two years. It's been like, a, or uh, it's been 150 uh, e uh, email newsletters. So you know, almost three years. And I'm just, I'm seeing the same stuff. I'm seeing fear. Uh, I'm seeing curiosity, desire, and fear every single time, uh, which is awesome. You know, and it's it's just psychology. Uh, you know, even when you read like copywriting books, like from the 1930s, like Robert Collier Letter Book uh, is one of the books that I, uh, I read recently. And it was a hundred years ago and the stuff is still relevant. So yeah, I'm, uh, you know, that's really just what I'm trying to do with creator hooks is get to the bottom of human psychology. And so far it's all the same. Do you see more desire or more fear underneath the curiosity? I will say that it, um, it depends on again, kind of like search or, um, you know, search or, uh, or browse. So, a long time ago, so I, I ran a, a niche website for a while, and so I was pretty big in the um, in the SEO stuff. And I heard that like Google only showed like positive titles in the thumbnail, or sorry, positive uh, like you know positive uh, angles, uh, um, you know, uh, not titles, but yeah, I mean, yeah, positive titles on page one. You know, so if you're trying to search, like nobody is searching like mistakes, like you don't, yeah. you don't search like, okay, uh, you know, podcast mistakes or like YouTube mistakes. You know, most people are like, how do I grow my channel? So for the most part, if you're trying to rank in search, you, you want to think, all right, what are people searching? And it's usually positive stuff. So I've got some stats for you out of the almost thousand titles that are broken down. 60% have curiosity, 46% have desire and 39% have uh, fear. That's wild because in the first video, the first time we talked over a year ago, it was 61% curiosity, still 46% desire and 40% fear. So statistics. <laughs> Don't change much when you that's, have a statistically significant sample size. No, that's incredible. I'm, uh, I didn't know I, I gave you those numbers last time, and that is crazy that they're almost the same. I really like this delineation again between search and recommended because you're so right. People are searching for outcomes. I don't think people actively search out like fear or loss or negative emotions, but we're much more prone to click them when we see them. It's like It's like an impulse buy versus something we go and seek out at the store. And what I see for a lot of the channels that are doing long form podcasts the way we are, they definitely take like the negative angle. And I find it personally, emotionally exhausting. You know, like I see how it could work. But the other thing I've, I've noticed, and this is this goes for content even outside of YouTube, when you lean into human nature to be loss averse or be naturally pessimistic, you tend to attract pessimistic people pessimistic people. And I don't know if that's like the audience I want to build, but it's it's undeniable to me the uh, potential of playing into negative human emotion because it drives results. So how do you think about that? Do you, do you see any correlation between negative titles and like sentiment around those channels? That is a, that is a fantastic question. So I've been obsessed with titles for a long time. I have like an Evernote document from like 20, like 16 or 2015 of like titles or like, it was like blog post titles that caught my eye. And I, I only put like five or 10 on there, but one day I was looking at it and it hit me. Every single one was negative. Um, and I am, uh, definitely a, uh, I'm a positive person. 
I am optimistic. However, all of the titles that I wrote down that grabbed my attention were all negative. So that's a, that's a little anecdote. So like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's not just, um, you know, it's not just, you know, the, the type of person, um, you know, who, who likes this negative stuff. It also depends on the content. Like you could, like we could title this, this, um, you know, this, this podcast, you know, you know, the biggest mistake every YouTuber is making with YouTube titles. And then I, th this conversation has been pretty uh, happy and pretty like positive so far. So, so there is a little bit of uh, kind of a difference between, you know, what is the title and what is like the actual, um, you know, content about. So it's not like, you know, we're doing like a teardown of, you know, like some like celebrity gossip. Then yes, you know, in that case, uh, yeah, that would probably attract those, uh, those people. Um, I think there is a difference between what is the actual content and what is the title that you're just using to grab somebody's attention and get them in the door. But negativity and drama and fear is just so good at grabbing people's attention um, that, no. you know, it's, it's tough to it's tough to get away. It's just biological. And it, it like hurts me to think that like, hey, I'm I'm preying on this psychological weakness that all humans are hardwired for and causing you like physiological stress in the in the moment to get you to click on this video where I end up making you feel better. But I'm re I'm reading this book called Wrapped Attention and the Focused Life by Winifred Gallagher. It's all about attention. And he makes this case that there are two types of attention. There's bottom up and top down. And bottom up is the like physiological, biological, hardwired nature of humans as an animal where we automatically identify threats and things in our environment that are screaming for our attention. And it's like this passive, it just happens. And then there's top down attention where you have intentionally said, this is something that I am looking for. That attention is more like physically taxing, requires willpower, basically. And so it strikes me that this is like, again, the difference between negativity and positivity. Like we are hardwired without effort to identify from the bottom up sources of potential loss or threat or danger. And uh, when it comes to collecting things that we want, whether it's status or resources or outcomes, whatever, that's more of a top down approach. So it's, I, I think, I think if you want more attention, the negativity side, the top down or the, sorry, the bottom up approach is probably going to be more effective. Yeah, I think it was Patty who said, like, there's no boring way to tell somebody that you won the lottery. You know, so like if you have something awesome, like then like tell them that, like, you know, just be like kind of upfront. Like, hey, this is this is a great this is an awesome video. You're going to love this. But negativity is a lot easier. Um, there are ways that you can <clears throat> use positivity and like and, and kind of come at things with a with an exciting angle. You just need to be a little bit, uh, a little bit more skilled. Um, it's hard, but it, there's certainly ways, you know, authority is one of the easiest ways. So like, you know, talking about Mr. B's like, you know, you know, uh, Mr. B's secret to, you know, building his YouTube channel. It's like, okay, that, that's a, that's a really cool idea. And it's positive. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, benefits, but it's not just like how to grow on YouTube. It's like, you know, you're using authority and you're using some curiosity. So you're using a secret there. So there are ways, um, it just takes a little bit more work, um, but you, know, you, got, you gotta be a little bit more thoughtful. We've talked about curiosity, fear, desire. These are three of somewhere between 40 and 50 click triggers that you catalog and talk about in Creator Hooks and Creator Hooks Pro. Can you first define for us what a click trigger is in your mind? Yeah, so a click trigger is uh, a trigger that makes somebody click. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's like kind of the easiest, uh, the easiest thing. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I got that from uh, Caitlin Bourgeoin. Uh, she's all, she's on Twitter. Um, you probably know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she, yeah, she's great. So I, I think I got click triggers from her, but I specifically made them for YouTube titles. I think I have 33 in Creator Hooks Pro. And, you know, at a high level, you know, fear, curiosity, and desire are those, are three of them. Um, but then also like within curiosity, you know, click triggers might be like opening up a loop or revealing a secret or being counterintuitive. And those are just different ways for, um, for you to like kind of write titles and how to like think super tactically about how do you write a good title and how do you build curiosity and how do you get people to click. 
of those 33-ish click triggers, besides curiosity, fear, and desire, what do you think are some of the most powerful that people undervalue? Um, I mean, the biggest one, the most, certainly the most powerful one is timeliness. So you might know this as like trend jacking or news jacking. It's like Mr. Beast Squid Games is the, the best example of that. So he kind of rode that trend of Squid Game being very popular and he got like 500 million views on that video. Um, so that's a, a testament of how, uh, how good, how powerful that trigger uh, can be. However, if he did it again, Squid Game is old news, right? So you can't do it all the time. Um, you know, another one might be like the Olympics. Um, so the Olympics are, are coming up in a little bit. You, know, you can make content around the Olympics. It might do very well. And then it might, then it's just going to totally flatline for the next four years because nobody cares about the Olympics anymore. Um, you know, same thing with like holiday seasons, um, you know, really any trend, any trend is like, uh, you know, you can blow up, but then not, like as soon as the trend is over, it's irrelevant. So if you're trying to grow fast, you can ride trends. Um, if you're trying to get a, you know, uh, I was listening to your to your interview with uh, with Ed yesterday. If you're trying to get a community of viewers, um, trends, you know, really isn't the best thing to do. Um, you know, you probably want to talk about, um, you know, timeless, um, you know, hopes, dreams, uh, you know, and, and fears there. So yeah, trends is the most powerful, but it's also the most uh, fickle, if you will. You've said a couple times that you don't like long titles. You've told me before you don't like having the word and in a title because it tends to confuse it and make it longer naturally. How long is too long? Or maybe said a different way, what is the what is the threshold that you try to stay within when you're writing a title? The first thing that came to my mind was like 45 to 55 characters. That being said, if you're trying to rank in search, um, you can get away with longer titles um, because like we talked about earlier, that you're actively looking for an answer. So you will pay more attention to the title. Um, it depends on your audience. If you have a younger audience, uh, it's primarily um, you know, thumbnail driven. It's like entertainment. And then you just want to have a really short, uh, like a really short title. If you are, if you have an older audience, then you can get away with, um, with longer titles. So, so it really depends, but you know, for, for most things, 45 to 55 characters will work. Do you think that there's too short? Uh, <laughs> no. So one of the titles that I recently shared in the newsletter was clear ketchup. And that was it. I think that's the shortest title in, uh, that I've, I've broken down in creator hooks pro. I think it had, or in, in the newsletter. And I think it had like a million and a half, uh, views. And they repeated the the title and the thumbnail. The guy held up, uh, you know, he held up a bottle of like clear ketchup, and the title was clear ketchup. Um, and it was just, it was two words. Um, <laughs> like, you know, imagine if like you hired me to write you a title, and I'm like, all right, Jay, it's going to be YouTube titles, and that's gonna be the title. It's only those two words. Um, but uh, but clear ketchup was so good because it's an oxymoron. It's like it's ironic, it's it's counterintuitive, it's not possible. So it builds so much curiosity. So no, I don't think it can be too short. However, for the for the most part, you're probably not making a video about clear ketchup. So um, so you don't necessarily need keywords in your title, um, but you need enough so that the audience knows what your video is about. Um, you know, how I think about it is I'm writing titles for humans so that these humans know what my video is about, not necessarily for the algorithm. What's bugging you about the world of titles right now? What are you What are you seeing that you're like frustrated by that the uh, the you think the space is getting wrong? Well, that's a great question. A couple things. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is straight up copying, copying your competitors and making kind of like the same video. Um, I prefer to whenever I can uh, get inspiration from outside of my niche um, and just try to do better. And this is also. This is me being a title nerd. So like, you know, of, of course I'm going to tr try to do better. Um, but, uh, but I think so many people, uh, they only want titles in their niche. They only want ideas in their niche. And I think that if people just opened their minds a little bit and just kind of, you know, realize that they can get inspiration from outside of their niche and that can help them grow and that can help them come up with like fresh ideas. So they're not always like a step behind and copying their competitors. I think that that would help a lot of people, you know, for like for Creator Hooks Pro, like my my like paid thing, it's a, it's a database of, of viral videos. 
And people all the time are like, oh, do you have titles in this specific niche? And it's like, eh, that's that's not the point of this. Like the point is to get inspiration from outside of your niche so that you can bring fresh ideas to your audience. So I think that that's it. Just like, you know, stop copying directly from your competitors and uh, kind of, you know, broaden your horizons a little bit. I love that advice because when you copy from someone in your niche, it's going to literally be derivative. This is the definition of derivative. So you can't really expect it to do as well or better than the thing that you're seeing. I mean, we see it in our videos now. We have guests on, they go on another channel and they take like the same angle. And it does pretty well, but not as well as our video because it's literally derivative. So I like this <laughs> advice, but how do I, how does one go about actually researching titles from a different niche? How do I, how do I get outside of my bubble to start looking at different titles that might work for me? So first off, I have a quick disclaimer. So I, I have a little, one of my little like side project channels. One of the best videos is copied almost word for word um, for, from another channel. And like every channel in this niche makes the same video and it's like the best video in every channel. So like there are topics that just work. Um, so like, you know, if that's the case, then yes, like, you know, there are a couple of them where you, you just got to make that video. Um, so I understand that. However, so like when I was a, I was a channel manager at a fishing company and we were like an educational fishing company in the Southeastern United States. So we were pretty niche, you know, we weren't worldwide or like, you know, even like bass fishing um, is, you know, is, is all over America. Well, we were only saltwater fishing um, in, a, in a small place. So what I would do is I would look up like, um, you know, like finance channels. So like the easiest example is, you know, a finance channel would be like best credit cards of 2024. So we would do best trout lures of 2024. You know, I'm not copying exactly, but like, you know, best blank of current year. Um, so we just took that framework and I like made that for myself, um, for, for our channel. And then we would do best redfish lures of 2024, best snook lures of 2024, best like flounder lures of 2024. So we would look for frameworks that were successful. And then we would see how, how often can we iterate on those frameworks. So that's the, the thing that every, I think everybody needs to be doing is just looking for frameworks and like, what's like the psychology, what actually made people click there, you know, getting back, getting past like, oh, this is about credit cards. No, this is about, you know, best list of products. So if you can try to just think of, instead of just the topic, you know, what, what is really making people click? Um, I think that's going to help you get inspiration. Um, and from really anywhere, Facebook ads, email subject lines, um, you know, uh, titles like on or headlines and like the newspapers, like the grocery, the grocery store, like, you know, those are, those people have been writing titles for like decades and, you know, their jobs depend on that. So you can get a like great inspiration from, um, you know, from those, from, uh, magazine covers and, you know, also like magazine titles. So those, um, you know, those are some, some things that you can, uh, that can help you get inspiration outside of your niche so that you're not just copying. I want to go and revisit the, revisit this, um, leap you just took from fishing to finance. Sounds like a brilliant move. How did you pick finance? And if it's, it's not finance, how do I just like pull out of the air a different industry to start looking at videos in that industry? Do you have someplace you go for a list of that? Do you have inspiration that you find somewhere? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So we were an educational channel. So I wanted to go to another educational channel. Um, it's great if you look at like some competitive channels, so like finance, entrepreneurship, um, fitness, especially, you know, look for these competitive channels or these competitive niches and think like, you know, what is working there? Um, you know, because it's not like, you know, basket weaving or something where like, you know, if one channel is like just crushing it, but that's only because they're the only channel and they have no, mm. uh, you know, they have no competition. You want to look for, um, you know, for competitive niches, um, you kind of, you know, adjacent. So like, you know, so we were, we were education and like, you know, these finance channels were also education. So kind of the easiest thing is like, you know, if I'm a talking head channel, um, maybe I do like, you know, news or something. I might look at other talking head channels, like, you know, maybe like, you know, religious channels or, um, or like, you know, sports news or, you know, like politics or whatever, just two is like kind of an adjacent channel. They have like the same content style as you. Um, you know, they're maybe a couple steps ahead of you. Um, and then 
you know, <clears throat> try to get inspiration from those. That's like one of the first things I do whenever I, uh, whenever I either start a new channel or I'm working with somebody, I create two lists called the Dream 10 and the Model 10. So the Dream 10, are, these are all my competitors. Um, and these are the people who are talking about the same topics as me. And then my Model 10 are, they have the same um, content style. So they're talking head or, you know, education or like, you know, kind of, or vlog, you know, whatever your style is or faceless. So I have my Model 10 and they talk about different stuff than me, but they have the same content style. And that's where mm -hmm. I get a lot of inspiration from. So pretty much like any question that you could have about YouTube um, can be answered. Uh, you know, how long should my intros be? You know, what should my thumbnails look like? Uh, how can I monetize? Uh, how long should my videos be? All of all of those questions can be answered um, from your Dream 10 or your Model 10. Disclaimer, I have a Creator Hooks Pro account and I was updating my profile and you have this drop down menu of niches to pick your channel niche. And that strikes me as a really, really great list. And it also mirrors closely lists I've seen in like podcast charts, basically. Like you have your arts, you have beauty and fashion, you have careers, you have entertainment, you have finance. So if, you, if you're hearing this, you're like, how do I just even think about different niches that are competitive? Go to like the Apple list, look at the Apple charts and see how they segment different podcasts. Those same niches exist on YouTube. And I think that's a really smart idea of saying, are you education or are you entertainment? What other things exist in the realm of education if you're there? What other types of talking heads are there? I love the advice of competitive niches as well because you know that they have to like really step up their game. Super, super smart. And I'm really thinking of, you know, what does my audience think and how can I challenge those assumptions? You know, what are they thinking? What do they know is true? Um, you know, I love kind of like breaking myths. I think that is a super powerful um, strategy that really anybody can employ in their channel. How do you do that? How do you get how do you really get in the shoes of your audience and understand what they're thinking or wrap your head around the myths that they know? The easiest way is to ask ChatGPT. Just look up like, um, you know, hey, ChatGPT, um, you know, I have uh, a YouTube channel for people who are into productivity. Um, what are their biggest excuses? You know, give me, give me their 15 bi biggest excuses for why they're not productive. And you'll get all these excuses. You know, uh, give me their, you know, give me 15 myths that they think are true. That's the easiest way. Um, you can also look and see what is working for your competitors um, on YouTube and just trying to think like, oh, are, is, are, is any of this stuff wrong? And then doing a lot of research on, on YouTube, um, seeing what titles are working, seeing what people are commenting, um, getting in on Reddit uh, and Facebook groups um, are also uh, other great ways to do that. And also Twitter. Um, I've been loving, uh, or sorry, X, I don't know, whatever, I'm going to call it Twitter. Um, you know, also, also Twitter for, uh, for trying to see what the, what the general consensus is. Um, you know, what are people replying? What are people talking about? What's getting attention? Um, so all those are great ways to, to do, um, you know, audience research. This is something that I see a lot. People feel like, um, they're creating a lot of the same content as somebody else. And it's because a lot of times we're consuming the same information as everybody else. So the more you vary the information that you consume, the more different that the end product you create will be. Most people are looking, you know, I have a faceless channel. And like, so most people are looking for, how do I do this the fastest way? How do I get somebody from the Philippines to write me an article for $10? Um, and just in my opinion, uh, everybody can do that. I think that if I have the, you know, the best content with the best titles and thumbnails, you know, I'm hoping that, um, you know, that I'm creating a, a kind of more legitimate channel. That being said, I've seen some titles in my niche that's just like totally stupid and bonkers and not true. And they have like a million views. So it's like, eh, you know, good for them. And like their content is terrible. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm thinking for long-term you know, what is what is going to be best for my audience and my channel. And I think quality over quantity and um, just being hopefully the most reputable source in this niche, um, you know, even if I have, you know, all these competitors, which I which I do because it's a, it's a faceless popular niche, um, you know, I think I'll still be able to stand out. And I'm hoping that by putting in a lot of effort um, and being a little bit more credible that my content will, I'll be able to, um, you know, kind of fend off all of the AI, uh, all the, like the wave of AI. Um, and I think just in general, if you can 
I think uh, credibility and authenticity are the two things that uh, it will not, the AI cannot take over. No matter how much AI is out there, if you can be credible and authentic, I think you'll still be able to make it. And if you were to give just one piece of advice to everybody watching that will help them write better titles for their videos, just one important takeaway from this video, or if we, even if we haven't said it in this video, what would that one suggestion be? Don't be original. Never just kind of come up with something out of the blue. Always base it off of a previously successful video. Um, that will help you write titles faster and also help you write better titles. And then you can write multiple titles for the same video based off of all those models and A-B test them to see which is actually the best. If you wanna learn the right way to A-B test titles, check out the first conversation I had with Jake where he takes us through the testing process. We dig even more into the psychology of writing clickable titles. Thanks for watching.